cross comes in. White with the header. And here comes Whitehead. It's gold for Great Britain. Tonight on Track and Ball Podcast with myself, Richard Whitehead and Alan White, we've got Britain's, one of Britain's top sprinters. This young man is passionate, he's opinionated, he's focused, determined, he's aspirational and inspirational to his peers. This this young man is a Lisham boy that has moulded his career on the track. Tonight we have actually got... Sweet boy James Ellington. What I want to know is why are you called Sweet Boy? Sweet boy. That's the first time I've heard that one. Normally it's it's, it's aggressive and intimidating boy. But yeah, I'll take that one. <laughs> so so the reason I heard it on an interview from the new performance director, Christian Malcolm. Oh, is it? Now really? this is uh, so it's a Diamond League interview. Yeah. And I think he was he was trying to say that maybe there's a bit of a change of character from yourself in the last couple of years. What What do you think he was he was trying to say? Oh God, I mean, if he was calling me a sweet boy, that's a good thing. That's like a sweet, sweet way is what he says in the endearing, word. isn't it? Endearing. Yeah, yeah, that's endearing. I'll take that. I'll take that. I'm Thirty-five <laughs> years you... old as well. It was your birthday. <laughs> I know. Recently. Literally, what four, three, four days ago? Four days ago. That's it. Yeah, what happy you do birthday, for birthday? Then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What, what do you I do? Know. What do you do for your birthday? <sighs> to be honest, I'm, I'm getting old. Not much. I went out for dinner with the missus. Um, actually, for the gonna... first time, for the first time, I actually reposted the birthday messages on my Instagram. Normally, I don't normally do that, but I thought I'm indulging this year. And we'll go into we'll go into um, whereabouts you are in the world because you're not in the UK at the moment. We're going to go into that uh, in some detail. But um, obviously, for for those that are watching, and listening, uh, your not just a, a national or an international, but a world-class sprinter that's um, had a, an up-and-down career. And mm. we want to kind of go right back to the start and uh, start with what was what was it in athletics that pulled you in and how how did you find that passion and was it always athletics for you? Yeah, um, for me... It started uh, when I was a kid, when I was like three years old. I remember watching uh, the Seoul Olympics on TV that far back. And for, I don't know what it was. It, I was just drawn drawn to athletics from that from that day. Um, and kind of, yeah, I just went, I did the usual thing that most athletes do. I just went through kind of primary school, infant school, secondary school, um, with school, school, sports day being the highlight of my year. And I was, I was lucky that I was blessed with a lot of natural talent um to be able to run fast um but i didn't really get into the sport um until i was probably I started training at my local club when i was about 13 14 um and that was because i got in trouble in the area with some of my, my naughty friends and i got grounded for six months so wow. uh, my mum was like right you're grounded yeah yeah you're grounded for a long time <laughs> six months that's so, a long time um, what kind of trouble I, do you I, get into I, 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 I knew that question was next I knew that. <laughs> but, but so what happened was me and my friend who was only or 12 actually he was a bit younger 12 we was uh we were sitting in a stolen car that was stolen from my older boys and uh the police arrested us and uh, so mum was like what are you getting arrested and you're 12 years old right Six months, you're, you're you're in you're in home prison. So I had no choice. I, I had no, I had no choice but to go to the athletics club in Crystal Palace, and that's kind of where I started enjoying it. The, the year later, I won the national title, and then when the kind of penny really dropped was I my mean, first. No, it was 2010, and uh, I took it serious that year, and I got injured, tore my hamstring nine centimeters, but I, I ran 10-2 during that race at PB. So I was like, no, actually. I need to get my head done and the Olympics were coming up and I just made a kind of proactive choice to actually, you know what, cut out all the crap now, let's, let's get focused and that's where kind of my career kicked off. So do you think that you doing really well in the, the youth age groups kind of gave you that little bit of taste of kind of success and kind of winning and that kind of pushed you to, to really sure. kind of go on to the next For level? Sure. For sure, because I mean, most teenage boys, you get they get up to the usual stuff that teenage boys get up to. But because I because I had athletics, I always had that in the back of my mind. So yeah. 
when my friends were saying, oh, we're going to a party this weekend in, I don't know, Brixton or wherever, wherever it is, I'd be like, oh, you know what, I've got, I've got flipping National Junior League tomorrow, or I've got the, the, the three A's championships on the weekend, so I can't. So it kind of always, because I had that in the back of my mind at all times, it, um, it probably kept me out of a lot of potential situations. Mm-hmm. Um, your your mum must have been a your mum must have been a good role model at that point as well. You mm. obviously yeah for sure yeah yeah I mean she's a driver down right? the country yeah yeah she she's a driver down the country she was like one of them real hands on um, mums that she was into athletics anyway so okay if it wasn't for her she would be driving up and down the country when I was fourteen fifteen to all the different national championships and you know how it goes um, and even some of my training partners like they'd always jump in because some of their parents weren't as hands on with their athletics. So, did, did you find did you find it quite easy to find um, an athletics club? Um, yeah, for me it was that because Crystal Palace back in those days there was like four or five kind of young training groups um, up in Crystal Palace. So it was, I went up there and yeah, just just kind of fell into it, and it was only it was only a fifteen twenty minute bus journey for me. So it was at the time it was pretty easy. I don't I don't I don't know what it's like now, um, but yeah, there was there was stuff going on back then. Yeah, time times changed, doesn't it? And you just kind of mm. like athletics now is completely t- different to uh, to back in the day. What what what, um, what do you think's the major contributor to that? Do you think it's uh, it's the the funding available, the profile, what kind of? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if you, you. I think you probably agree with me. I mean, I think back in the the nineties was kind of the the golden days of athletics. You had your real kind of you had your real larger than life characters it was like a, it was it was a more it was more i can't say mainstream but i think it was more popular back then um and again obviously nowadays you've got you've, we've still got our, our people we've got the likes of yourself and we've got people like jessica ennis and we've got our main people but in terms of like the culture around british athletics nowadays i think it's the night i think the 90s was much bigger so and these days again you've got the youngsters that are kind of more drawn towards football and rugby which I kind of, I don't, I can't blame them really, man. Because again, like you know yourself, I mean, mm. athletics isn't easy. And um, no. but you've got the yeah, internet though, right? So you've got the internet at the moment. So if you want to mm. kind of be engaged with like track and field, there's always like yeah. areas like um, like YouTube and stuff and other. Of course, other, yeah, yeah, other, yeah. yeah, Of course, but again, as well with the internet, then you've got access to everything else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So kind of a catch-22. I mean, I, I, I think athletics is such a beautiful sport and I think we've got so much talent in the country that it's a shame that more kids aren't really into it because I've seen so much talent over the years coming up that never really stuck to it. How do you think you can get like more youngsters then really engaging in, in athletics like nowadays? What do you think the, what do you think you could do? Um, do you know what? I think, I think it's kind of, it's the way you market. I mean, I don't know if you guys follow boxing, but over the last few years, there's a station called IFL TV and they've really kind of blown boxing up. Um, and I think it's kind of creating those, it's kind of like creating characters and rivalries. I think back again, I can only go back to the 90s, but you had these big rivalry, rivalries within our team and these characters. I think these days it's, ty- it's too kind of, um, sounds bad, like too kumbaya-ish. Yeah? <laughs> when you go to the track, I think like sprinters especially, they're, they're egos, like, right? Egos. Yeah, they're egos. They're, Mate, like, they're, like, they're like. I know. Yeah, exactly. I know that you've got an ego. <laughs> I, 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 know. Know. I know. There's been it's confrontations as well. Needed. I know there's been confrontations. <laughs> there's been a few. There's been a few. But to be fair, I'm always the defender. I'm always deep down. Deep down, the ego only comes out because I'm the peacekeeper and I want to keep everything. Love and not a hater, right? Like. Exactly. There you go. Okay, that that swings me onto it. A question or something that I was looking at. I was on eBay looking at a bit of memorabilia um, and came across sponsoring you, James. Like, yes. T- talk, talk, <laughs> talk to us about talk to us about this PR campaign you did in in, 20, in 2011. Des- desperate times, desperate times. <laughs> um, well, going go, leading up to 2012, so during 2011, <clears throat> it was kind of 2011 was my first official um, international team. So we went to the World Championships in Daegu, and off the back of that, I still had no funding or any sort of income I was coaching kids three two to three times a week from like um, pupil referral units and trying to keep on a straight and narrow um and I was thinking oh this is you know what this is this ain't nothing's given um so 
a woman I know who owns a PR company, she was like, um, she's like a godmother to me. Um, she called me into her office and said, look, let's, let's, let's knock, knock some ideas together and see if we can come up with to get you some sponsorship. And um, as a joke, I was like, oh, I kind of was like, oh, I'm going to end up selling myself on eBay. And obviously <laughs> those, PR, those, those, those PR gurus are like, it's amazing. <laughs> they yeah, loved I'm, it. They I'm, loved it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm thinking, huh? So within literally within two weeks, they put a uh, press release out, um, a photo, photo call, sorry, and press release. And those of the national papers turned up and was basically saying, yeah, we're going to auction James's sponsorship rights on eBay, um, which got. Uh, just his sponsorship rights, nothing else. That's it. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> but, so, but saying that, I did get some very interesting um, companies that wanted to sponsor me, which I had to turn down. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it blew up and I was on the red sofa on BBC and um, yeah, I ended up getting sponsored by uh, King of Shows, which was, which was, it, it turned out amazing. On, on like, from, from that campaign, was it that you wanted to, obviously you wanted the sponsorship, but did you want the publicity? Did you want to raise awareness about the lack of funding? Um, not really. I mean, I was always vocal on that anyway, but I didn't do it for that. Actually, I genuinely just did it because you I didn't have it. a, literally, yeah. I didn't have no money and I was thinking, I'm going to fund my kind of my year. Um, and then obviously once it came, once I, once I, I did gain it and got a sponsorship from the rest of it, it's, then it kind of turned into, and then I was a semi spokesperson for kind of the lack of funding and backing in, in the sport for a young, young up and coming athletes. Did you find that? Did you want that to be the kind of spokesperson? Like, did you enjoy that aspect or? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've always kind of, spoke my mind like Richard Richard will tell you um it's kind of like a lot of the times I've spoken up in different situations and people haven't backed me so I've kind of been isolated yeah <laughs> um but you know what for me what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong so even even if people are kind of whether they're afraid or they don't want to step on anyone's toes and even if they believe what I believe I, I can't I can't you know that's them that's not me so I'm that's always, what, that's I'm always going to speak all about like, it's all about trust yeah. and honesty and that's the reason why myself and Ellen kind of had the concept of uh, getting athletes that that we feel could um, spread the word that we're trying to um, educate athletes that it's okay to to speak up and um, mm. and to be vocal on what's really important to them. And um, yeah. I know at the moment with obviously the Black Lives Matter movement is very mm. um, topical. And um, when when, when me and Ellen had a chat about this before about obviously mm. both Ellen being a, 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 a lady, a woman, a, a sportswoman, and myself being a person with a disability. Uh, just, just like we wanted to kind of touch base with um, the Black Lives Black, Black Lives Matter movement, what it kind of means to you, and if you've suffered from any racism in the past that has probably affected you mm. pre-athletics and yeah. in athletics, and yeah. What's your, what's your what's your stance on it? It's really important to kind of touch base. With. Um, I mean, obviously, being a being a young black man, um, kind of, I've definitely experienced uh, forms of racism. I mean, lucky enough for me, growing up in the area that I grew up, it's a very, very mi- mixed area, and it's um, some, most parts of my area are predominantly black, so you would never really hear of any racism around there. Um, but I mean, kind of going through. Uh, different environments and being in different situations. Not so much that people have openly said, said things to me. Um, but you feel like you do, you do get judged. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, unless you are black, you, you, it's, it's hard to explain it. It's like, the, the empathy. only way I can describe it is, empathy, yeah, the only way, the only way hmm. I can de- describe it is obviously like, so if yourself having a disability, right? So before I had my crash, I'd, I'd have empathy for dis- disabled people and people in a wheelchair, but you don't really know what it feels like. Yeah, so no, you're like, no. oh, shit, right? I feel, feel it for that guy. Look, he's struggling to get in the door or something because he's in a wheelchair. You might, you yeah. think that for a minute and then it's kind of put aside, right? But it yeah. wasn't until I was actually in a wheelchair for seven weeks myself and I was trying to get around London. I was thinking, like, then you felt, I felt it. I was like, people aren't, people ain't care. They don't care. They're, they're getting in your way. It's hard to get into shops. Like, you're thinking, oh my God. So it's, it's it's kind of a similar situation being black. I mean, you can explain it to people, but people that aren't black don't, they don't really know what that vibe's like. You know what I'm saying? No. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I mean, like, it's, listen, it's, we need to speak out on all kind of, um, any any situation which has kind of either been 
put under the carpet like it doesn't exist or people have been kind of stigmatized or whatever the case may be for the, for their color their, their disability or whatever the case mm. so is it's, it's, it's a good thing that actually people are speaking out and actually a lot of people who aren't black are speaking out of it as well because again you hear a lot of people say all lives matter we know all lives matter that's 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 not, what that's not the point yeah. We, we, yeah that's not the point the point is we know all lives matter but we're saying black lives matter because actually whether it's in institutions companies or just in everyday life there's been there, there has been such a kind of disparity do you know yeah. what i'm saying yeah so, yeah and when you look at um opportunities for you moving forwards james um mm. Obviously, we've got a performance director, uh, Paula Dunn, who's uh, who's black, and obviously mm. Christian Mark has just uh, been uh, been appointed uh, the the coach of the Olympic team. Yeah. Do you, do you do you think that now that you can see, do you think you you now and other other black men and women believe that there's opportunities there within not just athletics but within sport uh, to climb that ladder after you've <clears throat> after you've finished sprinting? Yeah, for sure. Um... For sure, I think I think there's definitely opportunities um, with people people that are black and people of color. I think um, I think I think one of the things I mean we could we could go against it because Paula Dunn she's pretty she's she, she's a normal woman and so is Christian he's from a normal background. I think there's still kind of a class. I, I feel there's a bit of a classist issue, issue classist issue um, within our organisation and certain governing bodies. Um, yeah, I agree. It be, yeah, it's, I, I don't so, so much think. Obviously, there probably is an undertone of racism that's been in, in inside it, but I think definitely there's a class thing. I think the way you kind of, whether it's the way you speak or kind of the where you come from, I still think there's people that kind of look down on you a bit. You know what I mean? So, and and, and uh, would you say also the, the the tokenism? I think sometimes I find that uh, there's a there's a, a position there, and it's 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 kind of a tokenistic where I I think with the the uh, position of Paula, obviously world class mm. sprinter herself, and also mm. uh, Christian, has made mm. a real statement for mm. uh, British athletics uh, mm. moving forwards. And I also know Donna Donna Fraser's um, got a new um, inclusion and diversity group that's trying to really support those athletes moving forward, that are actually looking for inspiration. Do you do you, mm. do you think that would be that be a positive move for British athletics. Yeah, I mean, look, I, th- I think it's it's positive. It's great that it's. It, I think it's a positive move. I just don't. I, what I don't want, kind of British athletics or any other company company to go into, is then suddenly appointing people because they need to tick a box, right? So you've, you've had it with kind of women in the workplace as well at the same time, like. If, if 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 this woman's good for the job and she's better yeah. than this guy, then mm-hmm. pick her. Yeah. Not because she's a woman, you want to go, oh look, we're not sexist and we've got a woman in power. I, I think we still need still need to have balance. So at the same time, I think it's great that we uh, it's great that we're getting black people into positions of power within an organization. But at the same time, you still need to be level headed and don't just do it for, like you said, as a token to tick a box either, <clears> because <throat> that kind of undermines everything mm. as well you know doing I mean? it for the right reasons yeah yeah do, do it for the right reason do it because that person's good for the job and you're not seeing anything you're not see obviously we see color but you're not yeah. doing it because of whether they're black or it's they're not white. about they're that it's not yeah 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 100 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. now going into like so from not to just skip over this because it's a really important mm. subject um but mm. we want to know a little bit more about about you and your training um mm-hmm. so talk to us about like a normal kind of training week because you went from three days a week to to kind of six days a week working full time um what what yeah. did that kind of look like or how 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 was that for you making that transition um it was a shock i mean because i went to my first olympics training three days a week in 2012 um, and I thought I was professional, but obviously it wasn't. It wasn't until I moved, <laughs> it, it wasn't until I moved up to uh, Loughborough with a coach at the time who was employed called Rainer Ryder. Mm-hmm. And um, he let me know what professional was. And that's when I kind of started training six days a week and was at the track from 9.30 until 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, and that's when I saw the difference of actually, oh, this is real training. Um, so, and that, I, was a late, I was a late starter really because I moved to Loughborough when I was 26 years old. Um, so it's kind of like going back to the crash stuff as well. People go, oh, you're 30, 35 now. You know, you're, you're getting on a bit. 
yeah, I understand. I understand the age thing, but actually, if mm-hmm. you look at in terms of training mileage and that, I only started training. Yeah, yeah athletic like age. Yeah. yeah, there's still kids in the team that are, are running, but they started training full time when they were 19, 18 years old. You know what I mean? Um, so I, the way I look at it is everything's a positive as well. I crashed when I was 31. In my mind, I'm like, well, I crashed when I was 31. I started training when I was 26. I only trained full time five years. I've been, mm. my central nervous system's had a nice three and a half year break now. <laughs> I'm fresh. I'm good to know. <laughs> You're fresh, man. You're fresh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, talk, so, go on, Rich. No, no, no. Um, on, on. No, I was going to say, so you went, went to London 2012. Um, mm. You kind of finished fifth. Um, you didn't progress, <laughs> but here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, didn't want to say that, but, um, okay. but like, what what's going i'm like really interested so like what's going through yeah. your head on the start line in that kind of moment london 2012 you're on the start line Eighty well, thousand 20... people in that stadium yeah mate this, well you know mate you felt the cheers i think um i think that's the first time i think it's the first and the last time i've ever been in the stadium and when the the roar of the crowd hit me it kind of that like, took me back I what, did, what did you think it. what did you think when the announcer said and in lane i don't know five james Ellington. Yeah. Was, explain that. Explain, explain that moment. It's, it's like it's like a dream come true. It's like you, you feel like you feel like you're in a movie or you're watching yourself on a movie. It's mad. Like because I I'd seen my whole life growing up, thinking, oh imagine being in the Olympics and oh, and then I was there and then suddenly and then <laughs> and then you get bombed out and then you kind of go quiet. <laughs> and then you're like, oh shit. Yeah, 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 like, it was, it was mad. It was a mad. It was a mad surreal moment for me. In in two thousand six, that was my first games, and not many people in, in athletics know that. I, so I went to Winter Games in two thousand six, right. and I didn't have a great experience at all. Mm. Kind of came away mm. from it thinking, the next time I get to the Olympics, it's mm. gonna be better. It's gonna. Mm. I, I'm gonna have full control of that, and. Like looking back at your career, do you think mm. that 2012 is a real learning experience for you that you move forward from? 100%, 100%. I mean, I'm a big believer, like most people, when everything happens for a reason. And I think kind of going to that, <clears throat> going into that Olympics, I was so inexperienced. I was with a, an inexperienced coach as well. And um, this isn't me passing the buck because, you know, I'm, I'm the first one to take blame for everything. Yeah. But kind of, I went from training from three days a week, which I was used to, to this coach pushing me five, six days a week in a training camp in Portugal, which I was even questioning myself, thinking this is too much, but he kept telling me more, we need more juice in the tank, we need to get more. And I was thinking, we're not going to get anything for killing myself now. So I went onto that line and I, I felt great. And then my legs were literally gone. I was so tired. So after that, it, it was meant to happen because if that didn't, if that hadn't happened and I hadn't bombed out like that, I wouldn't have made the switch to move up to Loughborough, um, yeah. which kind of really did kickstart my career. Who what, did who was, did you who who did you room with James in 2012? Uh, I was with Mark Lewis, Mark Lewis Francis. Mark. Oh. <laughs> he he influenced me, man. He said you should get him on here because he was coming to the end of his career, and I was like just starting, and he was, he had me at McDonald's every day. Going, Come on, bro. Let's go <laughs> I was, I was, I, no word of a lie, yeah? the morning of my race, yeah? I was sitting in the breakfast hall eating a bacon and egg McMuffin and porridge with jam over it, right? Christian Markham <laughs> walking past me, looking at me. Christian didn't even say nothing. He just let me carry on. I was thinking, what's, what's he looking at? Thinking, like, what, you need what? to choose like, your friends wisely, man. Mate, like, mate, mate now, 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 now Christian's head coach, mate. I'm like, you remember that made me, he let me eat McDonald's, didn't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> What was it? What was it like when you did move to kind of Loughborough, like training at the performance center? Was that a big kind of shock? Was that did that really kind of push you on to, to the next level? Um, yeah, I mean it was all of those. It was a big shock. It pushed me on to the next level. The good, I think the good, the, the the good and the bad thing about Loughborough is I've always I've, I've never liked Loughborough. I always like oh, if there's one place I don't want to live is Loughborough, right? Close. And yeah. So it's kind of like when I got there, there wasn't much to do. So. It was good for my training because literally yeah. I'd train all day, go back and sit in the house and do nothing, and yeah. that's that's what I needed to do. Yeah. So it was almost like I was in a training camp for the whole year round. Um, yeah, yeah. And did that, did, you... did that give you did that give you the focus that you need at that point? I think it did. Yeah, it definitely did because 
I mean, I was up there and I was thinking, I'm not going to be doing doing all this for nothing. I, something something has to come of this because I've I remember you had a massive group London. as well, didn't you? Who was in your Who was in that group yeah. at the time? There's some world class athletes in that group. Right? We had Chris, Christian Taylor, Olympic and world gold medalist. Yeah, yeah. yeah we had um, even Danielle Carruthers at the time, hurdler, American hurdler. She was a silver medalist and world champs. We had we had uh, Tiffany Porter. We had Chara. Oh, yeah, yeah. Harry, Dwayne. Yeah. Even Christian Malcolm was there for a year. Um, I mean, you name it, everyone was in the group. I think 2013, the, 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 the worst medal at the national championships was a silver, and that's because we had the gold medalist in the same event. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. What a group. So, like, 2014, you're, like, building your career, more established, mm. kind of Great Britain athlete, silver medal, four by one, gold medal, four by one. Like, I'm really interested to know, like, the dynamics of, like, a four-by-one kind of, like, relay. Like, what what leg did you run? But then, like, the politics around who picks, like, the team and the heats, the semi-final. Yeah, yeah I'm really interested yeah. to know. Um, well, do you know what, like, obviously, we, we used to be, we used to be not cursed, but we was tarnished with this brush of always messing up because, I mean, we did mess up quite a few times. But um, I would say it was more that for me personally, I could run any, any leg, right? So I was quite versatile. Yeah. I could run first, second, third, or fourth, which this ain't me blowing my own trumpet, but not it's hard. Not many, not many sprinters can do every leg. So yeah. I kind of slotted in wherever. And I ended up kind of, I ended up slotting into the third leg being the main leg. Um, again, because I was a 200 meter sprinter and I had a good bend. Yeah. Um, but I mean, this is, I, 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 I'm, I'm totally honest, I'll say it here. There's there's probably about three or four medals that we missed out on, whether it was due to mistakes or whatever we should have got, and mm. that wasn't down to us. That was down to what a thing, right? So yeah, exactly. But <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the thing, yeah. The, what the public don't see is we train for certain positions, right? And then you will have somebody in charge that suddenly who, who's not at the relay practices, but they want to put somebody in a, a position they've not even been practicing all year and then you think hold on what what does what, 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 what this decision on then we'll go out there and then we'll mess up and then we get crucified on tv and say they've dropped the baton again and management they don't it's, it's nothing to do with them we lose our funding they keep their jobs and i think after 20 i think it was after 2015 i'd had enough i think i don't know if you remember this rich but me and richard Kilby. I don't know why we got killed. I didn't say that much. I didn't say too many bad things. But I was just, I just had enough. And we kind of went back backstage and the press were there. And Rich was like, yeah, we treat like slaves. They just, they just make the decisions. We mess up and then we get, the, we get the beatings for it. And I was like, right. and I kind of, he kind of encouraged me to start speaking. <laughs> but no, I Mate, mean, and it all went off, right? It all went off. And then me and him was getting killed on social media, saying that we threw one of the other athletes under the bus, which we didn't. I said, objectively in the interview, I said, I don't know what happened. I don't know if I couldn't catch him or if he went off early, but somehow that interpreted to the rest of the world that like James blamed him, which I didn't. Um, so yeah, the dynamics are interesting, but it's it's um, we've got we've got the talent, man. We've got the best we, for the last what, few championships now. We've got gold and silvers um, because finally, I, I was saying this for years, yeah. When they suddenly started putting the orders correctly, once I was smashed up and not able to run, then they started getting the order right and started getting medals. So that was. A bit of sweet. I was happy for the boys, but I was pissed because I've been saying what sort of orders we should be, she should have been having for years. Mm. Just putting that. Did out. you all, did you all get on as a as a team? Did you? Because I, I know the, 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 public, the public will see like four, maybe five, maybe six um, athletes, but funding yeah. wise, there's probably about ten athletes that are funded. So a lot of yeah. a lot of egos, a lot of because obviously you're racing against these boys. Mm four spots in the Olympics and then you're having yeah. to be part of a team that potentially mm. brings back the best hope of winning a medal in the 100 mm. metres or 4 by 100 metre event mm. Yeah I mean it was, it, was, it was there was a few little conflicts and the rest of it but again I think I mean I'm, I'm quite a pragmatic objective logical person I don't I don't really get, get emotionally involved in things unless I'm really pushing my button so I was always kind of, I was always like, right, whoever earns this spot, rightfully so, fair and, share, fair, fair and square should be in a team. Um, and there was other people in the teams that, yeah, like you said, they let their egos get the best of them because they feel entitled to certain things. Um, 
So there was always going to be conflict because you're going to have kind of differences in opinion. Um, that that weren't so much the problem for me because I can deal with the athletes. The problem for me would always be management that would be trying to lead this pack of wolves, but you're like a sheep, or you can't, or or telling different athletes different things and then making decisions. So previously we had one coach. I won't mention his name. I don't think he's in British athletics anymore anyway. But he at one point he was messaging all the relay athletes. Like, this is what the team's going to be, right? You're going to be in it. You're going to be in it. He was messaging us all different things like we don't talk. <laughs> and, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, hold on, you're supposed to be our team leader and you're messaging us all different messages, what the team's going to be. Like, how do we respect that? You know what I mean? So yeah. um, I think that's where a lot of the problems came from. It came from management. But um, I think Christian in the job was good when he was, a head, when he was the rear coach. Um, but the couple of years he was there, actually some of the decisions weren't his decision, which was crazy. Because if you're the relay coach, you've got the best eye, you'll see your hat, you're on the ground and you should relay, do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. Yeah. So you moved to Linford Christie as a, as a coach. Mm -hmm. Was that, did you, was he like a role model for you? Like, was that a big, uh, was he a big inspiration kind of for you growing up? Or what was the reason yeah, for yeah. you kind of moving yeah, for him yeah. to training I mean, group? Crazy. The crazy thing is because I watched Linford when I was a kid growing up and I always wanted to meet him. I was like, I fucking never meet Linford Christie. <laughs> um, and then obviously being in the group, me and him would have arguments. So I'm thinking, hold on, <laughs> once upon a time I wanted to meet you, now we have an argument. Um, <laughs> but we get on as friends. I mean, Linford's, Linford's a good coach. He's pretty old school. Um, so we used to kind of clash on that because after being with like Rayner, who's a real kind of technical modern day coach, um, the kind of, the knowledge that I gained from him and then moving to Limpers group after that was it didn't it didn't gel properly, but actually it did end up working because with his kind of old school training, hardcore mindset and my kind of more technical technically focused kind of mindset, I would sometimes step out of reps and he'd moan at me, but I know what I was doing because I wanted to save certain things and it worked well and I ran I ran a PV under him so Something did was did um did the, one of the factors, um because of his pedigree on the track was that something that you looked at obviously like I say national record holder obviously done mm. done so many incredible things on the track himself and mm. was that something that you wanted to try and replicate um with him and was it or was it the group or was it the venue or yeah I mean no I mean obviously I wanted to repl replicate and do all the stuff that Linford did. Um, but that wasn't the reason I went to his group. The real reason I went to the group is because after Rayner got fired from British Athletics, um, I had to move back down from Loughborough to London. And actually, my missus, she lived in West London at the time, <clears throat> and I lived with her. Um, she was actually going to, she was actually going to move up to Loughborough, and literally the day before she was about to move up, my coach got fired. So I was like, wow. Um, so it was more the fact I just needed, I needed a group, I needed a training group. So. It's kind of he was the he was the local coach. I knew I knew him already. I knew some of the guys in his group, and because I had the kind of knowledge of how to train and what I need to be doing in terms of training, I was like, all right, cool. It's not so important that Linford's an amazing coach. It's more of I need I need finishing to touches. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I th and I think when when you're in athletics as well, it's about layering your trainers as as well, isn't it? It's about kind of the the layers that get you to that point. And obviously, like 2016 was your best year. You ran like a windy 996 nine, in the nine. trials, didn't you? Yeah, um, yeah. Mate, breaking 10 seconds, awesome. Mm. But, um, what? Those Go on, explain, to, explain what... to me that. Yeah, explain to me what that entails. Cause obviously, I'm, I'm a bit naive with the athletics. Yeah, like... a, what does a windy, windy time mean? So, um, it's kind of so when you run, obviously, you've got a wind gauge and if you've got wind behind you pushing you or a wind against you. So wind against you is a negative, which is a minus wind and a wind pushing you is a plus wind. Now during a race, the, the legal limit that you're allowed to wind have wind pushing you is a plus 2.0 meters per second. That's the maximum, right? So they're, they're basically saying any a wind stronger than plus two meters per second is actually aiding you to run faster. So it would go down as a wind. If you ran with a plus 2.1 or a plus three, it will go down as a windy time, which means you didn't, do it unaided you know what i mean right, yeah so 
like Richard said in the uh, national champs, I ran nine ninety six, but it was a plus three point zero win, three three point zero meter per second win. Um, but the thing, I, the thing is, I was actually in that shape. I ran ten zero four. I, think. I knew you'd say that. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was, I was, I was. And actually, if you remember the race, it was the worst start that anyone could have had. I was two meters down, and I was like, oh and my god! And then it came god. through like a train. And I came through. Yeah, it's, even if I'd if I'd if I'd started out in that race, I'd have run even quicker. But it didn't happen. So, mate, I ran, I ran uh, my two best times, windy, and mine were like we weren't like three. Mine were like two point mm. one and two point three. I ran twenty two six nine, and I ran twenty two nine nine. And I've not ran legally under 23 seconds. Mate, I'm well annoyed. <laughs> I'm well annoyed. So I know, I know, because you've run 0-4, yeah? Yeah. I know, I know that you'd be, you're, you're quite annoyed that you've not done a legal uh, oh, sub-10 trust yet. me. Trust me, I'm proper annoyed. I'm proper annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is a question for like both of you to kind of discuss, but like the 100 metre kind of, the technical aspect. So for me, as like a footballer, I like, or an athlete I kind of love developing learning I want to be more explosive more powerful um mm. so like talk to me about like the technical aspect of the 100 meters for, for like both of you um like do you spend a lot of time really kind of developing that area both on and also off the track on, yeah um well I mean I always end up having arguments and debates with long distance runners and that because they're, they're, they're always a Oh, all you do is run 100 meters. You don't train, <laughs> but actually, but 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 actually, if if they knew what goes in, 100 meter sprints the shortest sprint, so it has to be the most technical because you've got yeah, yeah. such a short yeah. amount of time, and any little mistake you make can cost you 100. And 100 in 100 meters could be the difference between a gold and a silver. It's the most technical event. So, a lot of sprinters, world class sprinters, we're we're not just meted flipping powerhouses actually the good ones that they they're technically on point because you have to be every step the distance you're covering your foot placement everything has to be on point the knowledge is power right exactly yeah (laughs) so what so what james is trying to say is the smartest ones the ones that are successful oh thank (laughs) you so what happened to you rich yeah, <laughs> I know it passed, it passed me by. I think, um, I think for because I've obviously I've done both, and I've done, mm. I've obviously been a marathon world record holder, and then obviously went onto the track. And it's definitely the time that goes into those ten seconds or twenty two seconds is mm. is your train twenty three, thirty five, forty five hours a week just mm. to get on the start line on a Sunday blast out a 10 or 20 second race mm. and it needs to be on point and it's a, there's so many technical aspects of sprinting that can mm. then also transfer to other sports and it's around yeah. foot placement around body position about about synchronizing your arms and legs and how your upper body has a massive impact on how you move it um we we when we look at what we do now, there's there's obviously coaches that are starting to go into like professions like yourself, Ellen, like professional football, and um, I think because we spend so much time on those technical aspects, mm. those other sports that maybe don't are starting to catch up. But is it is it's an important uh, point that 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 sprinting isn't just about point to point A to B, mm. just running as fast as you can, because anybody would do it. The guys mm. that are like like games that are running like 10 sub 10 400 meters it is incredible like the the amount of technical support they have to put in in place and whether that's video analysis whether that's mm. uh the technical running whether that's a work uh with the plyometrics whether it's in in the, in the gym lifting uh weights fast it all adds mm. value when we do when we do our training it's everything has to translate into moving fast and I'm sure that's the same as you, James, because I, I know yeah. obviously you're really, uh, you're really kind of all your little, your little markers need to align for you to obviously sprint as fast as you can. Of course, yeah. I mean, for an example of that was that like Rich just said you train how many hours just for to run ten seconds, um, but then going in my 2016 season, I was, I had a great season. I'd run. Like I ran the windy nine, I ran ten oh four, ten eleven, ten twelve, ten thirteen. I was consistent, and I went to uh, Rio Olympics, 
maybe it's a curse with the Olympics, but again, I ran my slowest time of the year, but that was due to a technical thing this time. It wasn't down to me overtraining. This was, my head was slightly too low in the, in the set position when I was, when my hips were raised in the air, the gun went, and because my head was just a slightly bit too low, my weight was too much, too, too far forward and I stumbled. So that stumble cost me, I had to break to, to stand back up and run. So, which means I didn't have a drive phase. I wasn't mm. smooth. But do you think spending that extra amount of time on those real technical um, parts of your, your running would have massively mm. improved how you ran at the Olympics, do you reckon? Or was that just a mistake that you made it, that you didn't I envisage? Think, you know, I probably could have worked, looking back on it, I probably could have worked um, a lot more on my technical side of things, um, especially my blocks and my set position. Um, and that's where you do need a good coach because as much as I know yeah. where I need to be, when you're going in the blocks and you, you need that eye, you know, that, you need that coach's eye to really be able to watch you. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a bit of both. It was an anomaly because that season I was starting pretty well and I weren't really stumbling out of the blocks. But had that would that have happened had I had a correct eye on me every session of the year? Maybe not. I don't know. But that's kind of how technical it is. It was a tiny blip. But I went from yeah. being a 10 second flat sprinter to 10.24, which yeah. cost me the final mm-hmm. because Johan Blake won the heat in the quarter final, semi final in 10.14, which I could have easily run then. Mm-hmm. I was running. Yeah, the year, yeah. So. Definitely. Yeah. And you know that as well. You know that as a spinter. Well, James, I was yeah. looking on um, the Power 10, and um, I'm sure you know this because all, all, all spinners <laughs> kind of know where they're at, but you're, you're 13th yeah. on the all, all time yeah. um, British, yeah? You know that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course you know that. Of course you know that. So, so, <laughs> Do you know what? It's is, dropped, it's dropped a, I've dropped a few places since. I was like, oh, and what's name? Oh, uh, so, it, yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask, ask you a question then. So, name the top 10. All right. Who's number one, one then? Num- number one is Linford Christie. Yeah. Well, number, two, yeah. Num- number two is James DeSolio. Yeah. Number three is um, Reese. Or oh, close. Zarnell Hughes. Oh, Zarnell. Num- yeah, number three is Zarnell. Number four is Reese. Yeah. Number five is um, CJ. Yeah. Number six is. Uh, Bob Slay. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, what? Not Mark. Bob Slay. Um, Somebody else did Bob Slay. Oh, Joel, um, Joel Fearon. Yeah, Joel yeah. Fearon. Um, after him, it will be Jason Gardner. Close, no. Adam Jamili. Dwayne Chambers next. Dwayne, Dwayne Chambers. Then it's the same Jason time Adam, as Adam, Adam Jamili. Then it's uh, that's Adam Jamili. Then it's Jason, Jason Gardner. And then number 10. Is... Go on then. <sighs> oh, God. Number 10. Um... Also runs 200s as well. Um... Sugar. Double barrel surname. Nathaniel oh Mitchell God. Blake. Oh, no. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. There you go. Yeah. And obviously, you're, um, uh, you're 16th on the, the 200 metres uh, all time. But um, I think, I I think it was. Good, I <laughs> My 200's <laughs> whack. <laughs> Mate, you were rubbish at two. No, I'm joking, man. <laughs> <laughs> Savage. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and then we obviously both wanted to then there was obviously 2016 brilliant year and then everybody mm. has that light bulb moment in their life don't they like mm. 2017 man mm. what yeah, a yeah, light I mean... I, you know what you know what I, I think everybody has a light bulb moment my, my light bulb moment in my career when I kind of mine was like I think maybe in 2005 when the 2012 Paralympics was announced in London that was what mine was and mm. I remember, and this is because I, I, obviously I've known you before 2017. Mm. You're a different person after 2017, and I think something something happened to you because of because of that event. And I know obviously Ellen mm. wants to talk about it, mm. but it's just changed you as a person. And it's changed your kind of focus around what life yeah. is really about to you, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um... So, yeah, obviously I had my crash in 2017 during the training camp. Um, and, yeah, it was kind of, it was tough because I came off the back of the best year I'd ever had. And suddenly I'd had, I changed events. 2016, I changed from the 200 to the 100. And I'd done, I'd done 
pretty good in 2016, being, being the first year that I'd actually focused on 100. I was like, all right, this is it now. All I need is another two, three years and I'm going to take over and become the new 100 meter star in the UK. That's how my mindset was. Yeah. Um, and then when I went at Tenerife, I was training amazingly well as well, considering January, normally I'm kind of, I'm like a slow burner. Like I take a while to get going, but I was already like, I was moving and I was thinking, oh my God, this year's going to be crazy. Home, home world championships. I was aware that I could run sub 10, sub 10 seconds now. I knew Bolt was on his last kind of, last legs and and the kind of the, the, the climate in the, the 100 metres was, it was around 996, 995 mark. So I was definitely eyeing up for like, to go go for a medal in home crowd. And then, yeah, we had the crash, we had, we had the crash. So it was kind of like, I went from it potentially having everything to suddenly... Yeah, well, bam, zero, right? Yeah, yeah, that's how I felt, yeah. So what was it, was, like, it was crazy. What was like your, your mindset? Like, have you always had that mindset to almost like, you defied the odds, ultimately. Um, have you always had yeah. that mindset or has that developed as your career's gone on or was it because of no, the no, no. you had? It's, it's kind of, it's, it's how my life's gone. I mean, it's... Do you know what it is that like, I've always kind of I always used to sit back and go, oh, why me all the time? Like, why is it I've always got a, like I've always got a hurdle? Like, mm-hmm. I can I can run nine ninety six, and no one talks about it. Someone else runs nine ninety six, they get hundred yeah. grand contract. It's like, I'm like why, what's going on? But that's been my life. But so money's think, not everything, again, man. Money's not no, everything. No, no, exactly. like... yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm just giving an example. So yeah. Yeah. it's like going through my life. I was always like, right. I've never had it easy. Right. So I've always been used to struggle, whether it's what, whatever the case may be. So even in my early, before the accident, I've, ne- I've never had a smooth career. It's always been resistance or people trying to stop me for some reason or whatever the case may be. So I think all these things through my life just prepared me for the for the, for the accident. So when it came, I, I mean, it was a big mm. it was a big shock, and everyone's like, "Oh my god!" Like, and I would I would have been thinking if if I saw that happen to another athlete, I'd have been thinking, "Oh my god, how can mm. you deal with that?" But actually. This is like a true, you can ask, I think so many athletes were there, they were there. And I was laying in the bed and I was like, well, they said I might lose my leg, innit? I was like, well, it's not a problem. If I lose my leg, then I'll be the far, I'll be the new Johnny Peacock. I'll wing him out. That's how I, that's how I was thinking, right? <laughs> oh, so, Rich, that's, what do you reckon about that? <laughs> that's, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, well, if I do lose my leg, I lose my leg. Mate, it'd be, be badass. Thing. It'd be badass in the yeah. Paralympics. That's it. It'd shake it up. Yeah. I remember you telling yeah, me that so, as well. I remember you telling me yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of the way I, just, I looked at everything and I thought, right, if I don't lose my leg, right, and my leg heals, whatever, then I will I will jog, I will walk again. They didn't think I was going to walk properly. I was like, well, if I walk, then I'm definitely going to jog. And if I definitely can jog, I'm going to run. And it might sound it might sound deluded. And it sounded deluded at the time because everyone's going, mm, they give you that look of, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to do it. But they didn't believe me. Mm. I'm running I'm running now. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. And, and um, like, obviously, so worst, if worse came to the worst, I still reckon I'd mm. bust your ass on the track. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, 2000, so, 2009, you got back on the track after going through all that. So, you were anniversary games 2009, back 19. racing. Yeah. 2019, sorry, yeah, 2019, yeah. back racing. Yeah. That must have been like, again, you were back to. Going back to that moment when you first heard your name in 2012, James Ellington, yeah. that must have gone. Yeah. Like I've I've raced there obviously quite a lot, and and yeah, yeah, yeah. and every time they announce my name, it takes me back to 2012. And mm. you, I, your your family must have been looking at that point, going, "Man, James is like there's there's something special with James because he's come back. He's he's never had yeah. like a silver spoon in his mouth, and he's." Yeah. He's, he's had to work for everything he's got and from not walking he's now in a race with the best athletes in the world in front mm. of a, a full crowd again. How did that feel? Mm. And you must have been like yeah, it emotional. Was, it was, you must have been. Yeah. You know what's crazy, yeah? I was like, right. I was I was kind of picturing it before it happened leading up to it. I was thinking, ah, oh, when they say my name, maybe I'm, gonna, maybe I'm finally going to get emotional and let some tears go because I'm not really an emotional person, right? But then obviously when it happened and I was like, right, it felt amazing, but I was like, where's the tears? I was thinking, where's the tears? There's no tears. I was like, all right, cool. But in my head, I was like, all right, cool. That's because the journey's not done yet. When I when I got to that line on that day, it was obviously it was super special and it was great to be there. But I was I was pain wise, I was in bits. Like I could barely it's crazy. Lead lead that that week leading up to it as well. Again, 
difficult James life. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Five days before, I got stung, stung by a bee in my finger, yeah? And I had a mad allergic reaction. So my, I flared wow. up and then my pelvis that I was getting mad pain through <laughs> suddenly <laughs> become hypersensitive. So you know you know that feeling when you're like, your central nervous system is just finished and you just, you just, you, you feel like you got the flu. So mm -hmm. that happens. So then I can feel my pelvis more. And in the morning of the race, I got out of the shower and slipped and pulled my doctor. Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. so, I'm, I'm, so in my in my head in my head going into the race, I was like, right, I, I, I reckon I can run ten four, ten five today because I've I've seen mm -hmm. glimpses of it in training. But I did, but two hours before the race, I was thinking, right, I just need to be able to make the start line and finish the race because mm -hmm. I am in pain. I barely did, did a warm up. I was like, right. So when I got into that line, I was like. Right, just gotta to get to the finish line now. So that was my goal. I was like, right, just get to the finish line. And I was in pain. I ran ten nine, but I was considering the, the stuff I was feeling. Ten nine was, <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, oh yeah. my god, right, cool. And it was never about the time. I think never about the time. I um I saw that race, um, yeah. and I think I raced the next day. Um, and I was like, mate, I nearly cried. Serious, I nearly cried because yeah. I knew what she went through to get to that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. And Young people will see what you've done, and this is why you should mentor and support up and coming athletes because there'll be, there'll be athletes out there that are watching this and listen to this that be like, Yeah, I've gone through struggles like, like James, and mm. I've, I've, I, I feel that I haven't had the financial support that I've, I've, I've needed, or I've not had the, the, the tools I've needed. But they can, they can get a lot from your story. Never give mm. up. Um, no, no, no. And and your your determination comes through what you, what you said and uh, mm. actually you need to be re really proud of what you've done it because yeah I appreciate it man. A fi fighter bro right mm, I am I'm, yeah I am a fighter <laughs> uh, you got the way I've always looked at things is movement is life without trying to sound like some corny philosopher philosopher or anything but you can't just kind of you can never really rest and give up on anything like that because then what's the point of not 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 what's the point of being alive but struggles are part of life and everything that yeah. everything 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 in life is there has to be struggle behind it if it makes yeah. it worthwhile in the end so yeah man there's no there's no no surrender there's no way that i'd ever give up to <clears throat> just because yeah. I, oh, I, don't, I don't feel like i can do it so. no. and that's 2020 like, and, and you're in dubai now aren't you mate so tell us about that yeah man. tell us about <clears throat> what you what you're doing yeah so moment. i'm here i've been here been here since last year my missus moved out here for a job um obviously me being the kind of looked after athlete oh, I can go anywhere I want <laughs> so I kind of, <laughs> yeah I've followed her out here um it's good for my training because it's warm all year round um good for the Instagram it's baking baking hot yeah great for the Instagram even better for the Instagram um <laughs> it's kind of yeah and I, I come back and forth you know I'm, I'm in London London in in three back in October I come back in October October the, if I come back for three weeks, I'm going to start my training program over there. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be back and forth. And it's, it's kind of like obviously the pandemic's going on, which is which is affecting so many people. And people are sick and losing their lives, and companies are going under, and there's loads of bad things. But the positive out, thing out of it for me, this is not being inconsiderate of anything else, is actually this year, if the if the Olympics were this year, which I was targeting. Mm -hmm. Physically, I, I would have listen. You know me; I'd have run into my my legs falling off. But physically, leading up to that lockdown, my body was in bit like mm -hmm. my hips, and I was like, "Oh my god, I've got I've got three months. How am I, am I going to make this?" Somehow, in my head, my head was still telling me, "Right, you can do it." But physically, I'm, and I, I still get pains now. I still get pains now, but it's 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 not pain that I can't deal with. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's again shows your positive kind of mindset. Like this year's given you more life, more kind of time to train, get fitter, get stronger. Um, yeah. To hopefully yeah. qualify. No, I will. I will. No. <laughs> Mate, and, and I'm sure. And I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Whether you qualify or not, you'll you'll inspire lots of lots of mm -hmm. other athletes to take on their yeah. taking a similar journey. James, before yeah. we finish, we all, we do like yeah. ten questions that uh, mm. we ask all the uh, all the athletes uh, that we that we have on the podcast and uh, quite mm. random questions. So uh, we 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 start with those. Els, do you want to go with the first one? Yeah, I'll go. So number one is track or ball. Are you a track, track. or baller? 
It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty easy. That one's pretty easy. Yeah. So, so the second one, what's your greatest accomplishment in your life so far? Um, greatest accomplishment in my life so far. Oh, God. I can't even do the think, think, think. Um, greatest accomplishment in my life so far is probably getting back to where I've got to from this accident. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Now, do you believe in ghosts? No. <laughs> you're, not a, you're not a ghost fan, though. <laughs> no, no, no. What's the, what's the biggest risk you've taken? <laughs> well, I don't know if I can say them on the podcast. Um, biggest risk I've taken? Uh, God. Um, sorry, I'm... My head's you got loads, you got loads of risks. You have a proper risk that, taker, that's right? A, that, that's that's the problem. I've, I've, I've taken loads <laughs> You've got of risks. You've far too many. <laughs> um, I think the biggest risk I've ever taken was probably uh, telling the world that I'll be back from this accident and I'm going to make the Olympics. Mm. Nice. Okay, can you sing? Hell no. <laughs> Damn it! All right, so karaoke. Like, what would be what would be your your song? You don't have to sing it, by the way. We're not that harsh. Um, karaoke again. That's that, and I've never, I never do. But if I was to, if I was to do karaoke, I'd probably sing that like Celine Dion or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, oh, my that's, heart that's, goes that's on. Little... Yeah, listen, I've got a essential collection. I've got the whole the greatest hits, man. Oh, uh, people, 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 there's, there's more to me, mate. People, oh, I, yeah, need, yeah. I need, I need, to, I need to hear that, man. <laughs> when, are you, when are you the happiest, James? When are you the happiest? When I'm when I'm at peace and no one is disturbing my aura. When I'm when I'm in nature. When I'm around trees and green. And yeah, when I'm in nature. Nice. Okay. What What's the silliest thing you've ever got upset about? The silliest. I've got a lot. I've got upset about a few silly things. Um. God. All right, for example, the other day we was playing um, what's that game? Rummy Cup with one of my yeah. mates. Um. And he was just telling me to hurry up on my go each time, but he was really winding me up. I don't know why it was. And then it, it went from being like a jokey thing to me pretty much like having an argument with every single person around the table just because he kept saying hurry up. <laughs> and, he, and even in my head, I'm thinking, I look like an idiot. What am I getting so angry for? It's not even serious. And they're going, calm down. And I'm going, no, nah, I'm not calming down. And I'm thinking, I'm an idiot. You know? <laughs> where, where do you see yourself in 10 years? 10 years time? 10 years? God, yeah. my life changes so much. That's 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 hard. Um, Mate, you'll be my age then. Ten years time, nearly. I know, man. Just being old, boy. <laughs> <laughs> like, ten years, ten years time. I reckon I'm gonna be. Um, I'm gonna be in the, the Rocky Mountains in a log cabin, cabin somewhere. I've got a Canadian passport, so oh, I reckon I'm gonna. Be, I reckon I'm gonna be chilling somewhere in Canada. That sounds nice. Sounds good to me. Okay, mm. how would your friends describe you? Uh, I think they'd describe me as um, competitive, competitive. I think they'd describe me as um, moany, miserable, <laughs> um, hard work, yeah. And last one, so what's your greatest fear? My greatest fear, yeah. um, not fulfilling my potential. Mm. Right. Well, it's, yeah, mate, mate, well, it's been a pleasure you coming on today, and really appreciate it. It's um, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, really learned some, some more about not just yourself and your athletic career, but what it takes mm. to be successful under adversity. Mm. I appreciate you having me on, guys. Yeah, good. thanks, James. It's been great to chat to you. Not a problem. Not a problem. So that was uh, amazing to be able to talk to James and for him to speak so openly, um, not only about his positive mindset, but also the adversity that he's faced in his life. You know, the, the major crash that he had, um, obviously being in hospital for, for a prolonged period of, of time, really. And obviously, we've spoken before this, Rich, you know, we're, we're in the 
in the midst of a, a global pandemic there's so many people out there with so many different feelings and obviously loved ones as well um, suffering at the same time so I think uh, it's a really important message to, to still try and have that positive mentality um, we, you know we are going to get out of this at some point but I think that was a really nice message from, from James in this podcast and it also shows that um, we're not just uh, interviewing sportsmen with messages mm. for performance sport but also those messages of adversity and we are in a global pandemic and I remember uh, when James was talking about being in hospital and those kind of thoughts that were going through mm. his, uh, his head and you definitely need to have hope mm. and uh, James is somebody that has those has those takeaways within his messages but really it's about that that um that hope and having hope moving forwards and always thinking uh, with that positive mental attitude that you just talked about uh, he still wants to go to the olympics and aspires to go to the olympics that path might not ever be reached but he always wants to be better mm -hmm. he gets up every day and uh, he wants to better himself so anybody that's out there that is is struggling at the moment uh, there's lots of messages within the po podcast that I'm sure you're you're relating to your circumstance and uh, definitely stay safe and uh, hopefully you're healthy and look at James and he's come out of it the other side a better person as well as a better athlete so thanks for everybody listening to the podcast and and I'm sure you're you're enjoying uh, the the guests that we have on the show and uh, we hope to see you all again very soon Cross comes in White with the header and here comes Whitehead, it's gold for Great Britain.